In this video, we will study the forces that fluids cause on objects. To understand this, we must understand Pascal's Law. This states that the fluid pressure at any given point is the same in any direction. The second part is that the fluid pressure acts normal to a surface. Let's take a look at a differential volume of fluid to understand the forces that act on it. If this fluid is in equilibrium, the sum of the forces must equal to zero. Let's take the sum of the forces in the y direction. On the bottom of this volume, we have the pressure acting normal to this area, which is P plus DP, the pressure, times DA, which is the differential area. We also have the gravitational force acting on the body, the fluid body, which is the density of the fluid times gravity times the volume, which is dA times dH. On the top, we have the pressure times dA. Rearranging this equation, we get the dP is equal to rho g dH. For incompressible fluids that have a constant density, we see that the pressure at any given point is equal to the initial pressure plus rho g h. For an arbitrary surface submerged in a fluid, the resultant force on the surface due to the fluid pressure is equal to the total fluid pressure over the differential area. Here we can see that the pressure at a differential area is equal to rho g h, which is h of the area. Therefore, the sum of all the force on the surface is equal to the integral of the area of rho g h d a. If density and gravity are constant, this is the integral h d a. This resultant force is normal to the surface it acts upon, and it passes through the centroid of a volume of the pressure. Here you can see we have a volume distribution of our pressure, and the resultant passes through and acts normal to the surface at point P. Let's look at an example where I have a plate submerged in a fluid at a position h naught from the top of the fluid. This plate is a rectangular plate with a length of L and a width of B. Let's find the resultant force on the top surface of this plate due to the fluid pressure. Since the width of the plate is constant, I will only analyze the pressure along the length of the plate. In this diagram, I've drawn the fluid distribution pressure. Since the fluid pressure function is linearly correlated with height, we can draw this as a trapezoidal distribution. P2 is given by rho g h naught, and P1 is given by rho g h naught plus L cosine theta. This is the height from this fluid surface. If I create a new axis x prime and y prime, where x prime is along the surface of my plate, then I can express the height from the surface of the water as h of x prime is equal to h naught plus L minus x prime cosine theta, where this is the height from the surface of the water along any point of the plate. Recall that the resultant is equal to rho times gravity times the integral of h dA. Since the width of my plate is constant, this simplifies to the integral of rho g times the width of my plate times the integral of h naught plus L minus x prime cosine of theta dx, because I am integrating the height along the x-axis. Carrying this integral out, I find that the resultant is equal to rho g times b times h naught L plus L squared over 2 cosine theta. Manipulating this equation, I can simplify it to B times L times the average fluid pressure, which is 1 half P1 plus 1 half P2. Finally, I can write the resultant as a vector, which is equal to negative R times Y prime, where Y hat prime is perpendicular to the surface of my plate. 
If we have a pressure on a curved surface, the bounds of the integration can be difficult to set up. In this case, the curved surface area has a constant width of b. Since it is constant, we can take a look at the side cross section. We see here that we would have to integrate the pressure over a line integral dl. This can be a challenging integral to set up, so there's another method we can use to make this a little simpler. Looking at the cross section again, we can isolate a section of fluid that is bound by the surface and a x and y axis. Then we can take a free body diagram of this section of fluid. There must be a reaction force that is equal and opposite to the reaction of the pressure pushing on the surface A to B. Then we can break up the pressure on our fluid into a y component and an x component, where the y component is constant since the height is the same all along the x line. Note that we have a triangularly distributed force from C to B because the height is increasing as we go from C to B. Finally, there is a weight, which is the applied weight of the fluid. Since there is a uniform width, the weight is equal to the density times gravity times the width and the area of our section of fluid. The weight acts at the centroid of the volume of fluid that we take as our cutout. We can then take the sum of the forces in the y-axis to find our resultant. We see that the y component of our resultant is equal to Py plus W. To find the x component of our resultant, we will take the sum of the forces in the x direction. We find that the resultant in the x direction is equal to minus Px.